thank you very much. Um, that was terrific. So um, I have a hard act to follow. Trying to think about how to uh, talk about discovering connections in personality assessment, and I realized I came at personality assessment a little bit backwards, um, and so probably the way to begin is to talk about how I got here. I uh, began at Amherst College in the fall of 1977. I was actually pre-med at that time. Some of you who follow closely these sorts of things may know that there's been some controversy at Amherst <laughs> in recent months. Uh, although it is not true that uh, the college was named after Lord Jeffrey Amherst, people believe that that's the case. In fact, the town was named after Lord Jeff, uh, and the college was named after the town. There were a number of towns <laughs> that were named after Lord Jeff. If, in, uh, there's a, uh, Amherst, uh, New York, outside of Buffalo. Uh, there's an Amherst in Canada as well. He got around. <laughs> Lord Jeff was a, a British soldier who was tasked with um, settling uh, lands in western New York uh, and in New England and in Canada, which meant uh, taking them from indigenous peoples. Lord Jeff uh, was not a person who particularly liked to fight. So his uh, solution to uh, taking the lands in western New York and New England was to befriend the local residents and to gift them with a uh, gift of blankets that was contaminated with smallpox, to which they had no resistance and therefore no fighting. He proposed this, in fact, to his superior who put the kibosh on the idea. But there's no getting around the fact that fundamentally what Lord Jeffrey Amherst was was a pioneering bioterrorist. Not surprisingly, what you've been reading perhaps in recent months, and they did it. Uh, they have now disavowed their association with uh, Lord Jeff. Fortunately, Jeffrey Amherst is not the only well-known figure that's associated with the college. Calvin Coolidge, our 30th president, Silent Cal, class of 1895. Clarence Birdseye, yes, he is a real person, father of frozen foods, entered in 1906, dropped out of Amherst in 1908 to begin his frozen foods business. It's a good move. <laughs> Burgess Meredith, we may remember him fondly as the penguin from Batman, but there's much more. He originated the role of George in the 1938 film of Mice and Men. Lon Chaney played Lenny. And our most distinguished <laughs> Amherst alum, Bob Berard, there he is. Also class of 1931, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> So as I had mentioned, I um, entered as an undergraduate and to get through the uh, pre-med program um, at Amherst, uh, th that was, those were the gateway courses. You had to take two semesters of chemistry, you had to pass the class in genetics, you had to um, take two semesters of physics. I, I was not the most devoted student. I did not make it through the pre-med program, hence my, my presence here. Um, <laughs> my, um, my memory of this, and it's a very clear memory, I mean, I clearly remember getting tossed from the pre-med program, there's no, no doubt about that, but the, the other part of my memory, and you, not all of you know this, um, after uh, leaving pre-med, I majored in psychology, I also majored in art, art history. And, um, and my memory of this is, is that I was a, a okay psychology student, um, but that I was a great art student, this, not painting, um, this was art history. Um, and that I, uh, when I was 
coming close to the end of college, had to make a choice about which career path to take and made this prudent choice that there were probably going to be more academic jobs in psychology than in art history, which I think is true. Um, and so that's the path I took, despite the fact that I really was a better art student than psychology student. So I'm putting my talk together now over the holidays, over Christmas, so I went to look for my transcript so I could go find you know, how, what I got in those different classes. Couldn't find it. Um, so I email um, the college, and it turns out even they still have the they still have it. Um, and so you can see there it is. Um, then, and this is uh, what arrived, and you, you see it, it showed up in January of 2016. Uh, so I could check on my my performance. Let's take a closer look. Um, <laughs> and uh, indeed, uh, it, it, the world is probably a better place that I'm not a physician. I started out in uh, the at Chem 11 there in the fall of, of 1977, got a B minus. That probably should have been a bit of a red flag. It was not to me. Um, I was oblivious. Uh, at Chem 12, the next semester, chemical principles, that, that really was probably the beginning of the end. Um, <laughs> then uh, the semester after that, Bio 21, that was the absolute gateway class in um, the pre-med program at Amherst. Uh, it was taught by the two people who chaired the pre-med committee, uh, genetics, using their genetics textbook, uh, and I got, well, you see what I got. And I was yet undaunted, I have to say, by this, and um, finally was called in by the chair of the pre-med committee who, who said, and this I, I really do remember, um, Bornstein, get out of here, quit wasting our time. This is not, not in the future for you. And, and I did. And um, so, so that was that. Um, and, I, and you can see, now I, I shift over and I'm beginning to take psychology classes and I'm beginning to take art classes and all, all is well. Um, but uh, as I look at this, I am surprised that in fact I was not a great art student. Uh, in fact, I, I, I got nothing but B's in art. I, 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 <laughs> I'm, ge I'm genuinely shocked to discover this. I'm genuinely shocked to discover this. Um, I got a few A's in psychology, not that many, but um, zero in art. And so now the uh, question kind of arises, you know, to me, how does this happen? Um, I, I think there's two morals to the story, one of which is not terribly surprising, the other was a little bit more surprising, at least to me. Probably the one that's least surprising, less surprising at any rate to most of us, um, <laughs> is, is, is true. Uh, autobiographical uh, memory is, is really more fragile than we think. I, w we have great confidence in it, but you know our confidence is really unrelated to the degree to which it, it contains anything resembling truth. Um, here's the other part that's kind of interesting. Uh, I um, wanted, I, I, I guess, I wanted to see myself as this great but unrequited um, art student. Our first master lecturer tomorrow, Dan McAdams, is going to talk about that. I can't begin to capture what he's going to say, but I can, I can begin to capture what he's going to say. Um, just by reading you the first uh, line of, of the abstract there, which encapsulates for me my experience of myself, which was narrative identity is a person's internalized and evolving life story, integrating the reconstructed past and imagined future to provide life with some degree of unity and purpose. And that's, I think, how I got to where that was. That's how I think I got to where that was. So, okay, all was well and good. Um, I, I certainly, it, it, have no regrets about majoring in art. I, I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, there are more artists that I could speak of um, than we have time to talk about, but one in particular who's had a lasting influence on me uh, and my work, Kandinsky, not only because I really love his paintings, um, but also because he is uh, relatively unique among artists in writing about the process and about what went on in his mind as he put together his work. And so just to read a couple of quotes from that, that 1914 uh, book, says Kandinsky, uh, the composition is a mingling of color and form, each with its separate existence, but each blended into a common life which is called a picture by the force of the viewer's inner need. And then he says, 
To let the eye stray over a palate produces a dual result. In the first place, one receives a purely physical sensation, impression, sorry. But the superficial impression of varied color may be the starting point of a whole chain of related sensations. And Kandinsky, if you are familiar with his work, really actualized this thinking in what he did. So if we look at three landscapes that are painted over the course of a decade, right around when he's writing this book, you can see in the first, it's clear that you're looking at a landscape, an impressionistic one, but it's a landscape nonetheless. And then look what happens as you move forward through the years. Um, he takes away much of the landscapiness of the landscape and compels you to impose it yourself. By the time we get to the third painting, you really have to do some work to make this a landscape, but you can if you do. And this all makes sense to me. With this as context, when a couple of years later, I'm handed this, <laughs> my reaction to that is, you know, we knew that. What's new here? And that, I think, is a little bit the virtue of getting outside of ourselves in our work. So, in the fall of 1981, uh, started the doctoral pro program at SUNY Buffalo. That is where Mary and I met. You know that we met uh, at the new student orientation um, just after the start of the um, uh, fall uh, semester in 1981. And in uh, the uh, doctoral program at SUNY Buffalo, UB at the time, the um, big first year course, actually uh, two courses, uh, was personality assessment. Personality assessment one and two, PA one and two. Um, this was a big deal to us. And we, uh, at that time, learned about what was the um, standard test battery. This was the standard test battery in 1981. So if you were uh, assessing a dysthymic uh, and homesick college student, this was the test battery. And if you were assessing a labile first responder with a history of acting out who had a house full of weaponry, this was the test battery. Things have changed. Since 1981, we've shifted from a standard battery to individualized assessment. As we'll hear over the next few days, our work is taking place in a much broader range of contexts and settings. We've moved into places we wouldn't have imagined when I was in graduate school. And in moving into those different contexts and settings, we've become increasingly concerned not only with construct validity and psychometric soundness, but with the clinical utility of our measures, the, the, the accessibility, the patient friendliness of our measures as well. But two challenges remain. We've come a long way. One is, I think we need to continue to work to move beyond mono-method assessment. Um, I got interested in this issue a while back, reviewed the literature on the methodologies used by personality disorder researchers over a period of years. There's a lot going on here. Um, I will, I'm happy to send you the PowerPoints to get a closer look at some point. But the bottom line is that um, most of our studies rely exclusively, uh, relied exclusively on self-report data. Tricky situation under the best of circumstances, particularly so when we're looking at personality pathology. Uh, more recently, surveying the literature on the measures, the, method, the methods and measures that we use in uh, construct validity studies in our leading journals, we find that the same thing is true. We tend to assess the construct validity of new measures by seeing how they compare to other existing self-report tests. Uh, we are not uniquely guilty of this. Uh, when I was interested in this issue, uh, surveyed the literature, surveyed uh, the um, uh, representative sample of studies from 
the APA's seven most widely subscribed journals from 1991 through 2000 and found the exact same thing. By and large, people are using questionnaires as outcome measures in their research, and this is certainly not in any way limited to personality assessment or clinical psychology, not at all. What else must we do? Move beyond mono-method assessment and perhaps work to get beyond our correlational methods. Surveyed those literatures as well. I'm showing you the same uh, table, in fact. And what we find is, is that the vast majority of uh, personality disorder studies, in this case now 90%, um, rely on correlational methods. And the same thing turns out to be true, seems to be a magic number for some reason, uh, in the world of um, construct validity. So our modal, our modal um, uh, paper is a, a correlational study involving two self-report scales. I'm guilty of it too. I'm guilty of it too. I do it too. We all do it. I mean, we're trying to get work done, and oftentimes this is a way to get work done, and we do it. I, I get that. Here's the problem when you place it into a broader and uh, deeper context. So if I can paraphrase Guilford, this is from the 1940s, um, he suggests correctly, when validity is equated with magnitude of predictor criterion association, a test score is, by definition, valid for anything with which it correlates. Slightly uncomfortable, but more so when you pair it with an observation by Paul Meal 30 years later. In the social sciences, everything correlates to some degree with everything. And you can see how we may find ourselves fairly quickly running in circles and chasing our tail as we do this. But I think there is a way out of that circle, and I think that the way out of that circle is to shift our focus from outcome to process to think uh, a little bit less about what a test predicts and more about how and why it predicts it. To do that, we have to look beyond test score convergence and take us a, a longer look at places where test scores that should have converged, in fact, diverge in a way that is informative. And when we have some sense of why that might be, let's get in there. Manipulate those processes to see if they alter test scores in theoretically meaningful ways. I think that's, that's a useful path to take. We began to do that. We began to do that, and a third challenge quickly popped up. It is a challenge. All challenges are also opportunities. If you looked carefully at my um, transcript, you know that I did not sleep through physics. I got a solid B minus. <laughs> and I remember the observer effect. The act of observing inevitably alters the phenomenon being observed. Now, the observer effect arose in quantum mechanics and then shaded over into thermodynamics to the, to, the, to the physicist. The interesting question is how does observing particles affect the particles being observed? To us, the interesting question is how does observing people affect the people being observed? The answer is it depends on how you observe them. What happens when we administer a self-report test? And let me give you a couple of examples of self-report test items so you can feel it. Here's an item from the interpersonal dependency inventory. And think about how you might answer that item. I would rather be a follower than a leader. Your job is to uh, think about that, circle a number from one to seven, and you know, unless you're really resistant, that, that is what you'll do and that is what your patients do. And I'll tell you now that the same process you go through in answering that question is exactly the process that your patients go through in answering that question. Or here's one more from the interpersonal dependency inventory. I have a lot of trouble making decisions by myself. How do I answer that question? I think what you do is, is that you turn your attention inward and introspect. And then you do a little bit of an autobiographical memory search. You retrospect. And to the extent that instances come to mind easily, can I think of a time when I had trouble making decisions by myself? 
And if, the, and if, if you can think of those instances and you say, well, yeah, um, yeah that's, that's true of me. And you say, well, I'm, should, then I should circle six. And then you do an adjustment, and that is what we do. And that is absolutely natural, and it's absolutely normal. You say, well, I should circle six. I'm not really circling six. Psychologist, um, I'll circle five. <laughs> and that's what you do. And that's what patients do, and that's what they should do. Uh, here's the problem. This is a great article. I recommend it by Tim Wilson and Elizabeth Dunn on the limits of self-knowledge. And let me read you a little bit of the abstract. Because of personal motives and the architecture of the mind, it may be difficult for people to know themselves. People often attempt to block out unwanted thoughts and feelings through conscious suppression and perhaps through unconscious repression, though whether such attempts are successful is controversial. That's not the interesting part. Here's the interesting part. A more common source of self-knowledge failure is the inaccessibility of much of the mind to consciousness, including mental processes involved in perception, motor learning, personality, attitudes, and self-esteem. Introspection cannot provide a direct pipeline to these mental processes, though some types of introspection may help people construct beneficial personal narratives. So let me suggest that there's an unintended consequence of introspection. Because we have limited access to mental contents, but we have to give an answer, we start confabulating. We don't do it deliberately. We don't even do it consciously, but we do it. And the thing is, is that when you pull an autobiographical memory off the shelf, hold it up, look at it, and then file it away again, you don't file it away unchanged. You've altered it. Every time we ask people to introspect, we mess up their life narrative a little bit more. A different process emerges when we administer what was once called a projective test and now tends to be called a performance-based test, but should really be called a stimulus attribution test, because that's what's going on. And trying to understand what's going on in the minds of people who respond to uh, ambiguous stimuli. And that's a tricky thing. And I think what provided us with some clue was work that some of you will be familiar with, not everybody. I put this up because it's the most popular representation of this work. Dan Wegner's famous white bear studies from the 1980s and popular enough that in fact they were on the news for a little while. It was one of those great two minute evening news stories. Um, but much good work went into that. And in Dan Wegner's work on what's come to be called the paradoxical effects of thought suppression. Also, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the ironic rebound effect, which will make sense in a moment. What turns out to be true is, is that when you ask people not to think about something, they seem to have no choice but to think about it. And the basic design of his paradoxical effects of thought suppression studies, encapsulated in this one, was, they're all variants of this, of one kind or another, is you have people come in, you have them sit down, you ask them to free associate, or talk into a microphone, or something along those lines, for five minutes. Fine. And then you come back in, and you tell them this, and you say, for the next five minutes, please verbalize your thoughts as you did before, with one exception. This time, try not to think of a white bear. Every time you say white bear or have white bear, come to mind, please ring the bell on the table before you. 
Now, you know what happens, and you can imagine yourself in this situation. In the first five minutes, you, you didn't ring the bell at all, at once, maybe once. Um, in the next five minutes, you're just ringing away, you know? Because what's going on? You've been told not to think of a white bear, so you're careful not to think of a white bear. How do you know you're not thinking of a white bear? You have to keep checking in there and saying, am I doing the white bear now? Okay, no, I'm good, I'm still good, I'm right, I'm good. Uh, and and that, that, hence the paradoxical effect of thought suppression, hence the paradoxical effect of thought suppression. And the ironic rebound part of this is, is that even after it's all done, let them wander around for five minutes, it's, it's, it's there, it doesn't go away, it's just there, you know, it's just there, okay. So, hmm, what does that mean? Um, it turns out that this, is, this, this process has, has been talked about in other contexts as well, and it's been talked about by social psychologists uh, who also, by the way, study projection. They study social projection, not projection like uh, traditionally analysts have talked about it. Uh, and um, they have a nice kind of way of thinking about the processes involved in, in social projection that I hope, if I'm saying it right, uh, really line up nicely with the, uh, the white bear problem. And so suppose you're a person who's kind of an angry person, but you don't want to think about yourself as being angry. So what do you do? Well, you try not to think angry thoughts. And every time something happens that you're wondering if that might have been uh, evidence of anger on your part, like, did you cut in front of the car in front of you too quickly? Um, you say, was that angry? Um, and, and you say, no, no, that was not me being angry. So two things happen as a result of this ongoing monitoring process. Is one, you emerge at the end of it with a conscious perception of yourself as not being an angry person. Good, you win. The other thing is, is that every time you dip back in there to say, was, was that angry? Um, you have primed anger. You have primed the anger construct. It is now on the top of your head. It is an active schema, and it is just waiting to spill out into anything ambiguous that you give to it. So we went into the lab to see if that might be true. We didn't study anger. We studied dependency. And here's what we did. We selected people. These were college students. We selected people who had scored either high or low on the interpersonal dependency inventory and the items I showed you, th those were the items. Um, and so we uh, selected people who scored high versus low on the interpersonal dependency inventory um, and we had them complete the Rorschach oral dependency scale. Now the oral dependent language scale in RPAS, back then it was the ROD, the ROD scale. And then after a period of delay, we gave them some false feedback about their IDI scores. This is actually a couple of weeks later. We gave them some false feedback about their IDI scores. So half of the participants, and by which I mean half of the high IDI people, half of the low IDI people, are in the dependent condition. And they receive a printout that looks like that. And let me get, because I brought it. the instructions that we read to them. And so the people in the dependency condition see that and they hear, okay, here's your printout. These are your percentile scores, how high you scored on each scale relative to other college students. Your highest score is in the insecurity scale. Your other high scores are on the vulnerability and low self-confidence scale. You also scored high on the reliance on other scale. These scores indicate you're a dependent person and insecure in social situations. And then low, the people in the low dependent uh, uh, condition get, here's your printout. These are your percentile scores, how high you scored relative to other college students. You didn't score high on any of the scales, which indicates you're basically an independent person confident in social situations. As you can see, your scores on these subscales are right in line with the norms. We apparently did not have room for subtlety in our, uh, in our feedback. Um, subtlety has no place 
in psychology experiments. And um, so that's what we did. And then we administer uh, the Rorschach oral dependency scale, uh, uh, Rorschach oral dependency scale a second time. And here's what we, here's what we got. Um, let me disentangle it. Uh, if you look, you can see that um, anyone in the irrelevant feedback condition, the control condition, this being the, uh, the triangle people and the X people, um, uh, low dependent feedback, no change in your um, uh, oral dependent imagery from time one to time two. If you look at the high IDI people who get dependent feedback, these are the diamond uh, people there, um, that's not particularly worrisome to them or perhaps not even noticeable to them. They, in effect, came into the lab and said, yeah, I'm needy, I'm clingy. And then you told them, well, you're needy and clingy. So, you know, that's that. Um, the group that was uh, apparently affected by this is the people who uh, scored low on the IDI, the people who came in and said, I am a confident, competent, and self-aware self person. And you said, eh, not really, you know, you're not. Um, and now we have uh, uh, dependent imagery spilling out uh, all over the place. And there you are. So two um, contrasting processes is what it is. Two contrasting processes is what it is. If um, we're talking about uh, self-attributions, uh, as, we, as, as we assess self-attributions, we help people reconstruct their life narratives, even if we don't want to. Uh, and uh, stimulus attributions are driven by chronically accessible schemas. So now we know a little bit more about what's going on inside the head of the person, and that's what it meant when we need to shift our focus a bit from outcome to process, from what a test predicts to how and why. And that's where we are, but you know, there's much left to be done, and let me just suggest two ways, two areas that we all, and collectively we all, uh, can move forward in this area, and one has to do um, with opportunities and challenges in uh, neuroscience. We are already, I'm using the collective we, I take no credit at all for this, uh, doing great work in this area, right here in this room. Um, and uh, some of those connections are being delineated in very useful ways. One of last year's poster award winners, yes, I saved it, uh, is doing work in this area too. Neuropsychoanalysis, one of the real growth areas in psychoanalytic uh, research and practice. Tomorrow's other master lecturer, John Cassioppo, is going to tell us about um, social neuroscience and the use of um, neuroimaging techniques to know what's going on as people respond to items like this, tasks like this. He invented the field of social neuroscience in 1992. The other area where I think we uh, have uh, room to grow uh, has to do with uh, social information, uh, excuse me, social cognition, information processing. Uh, one of the things that I loved about art and still do is that artists, some artists, are really very good at turning the uh, spotlight, if that be the word, the camera, I don't know what the right metaphor is, on themselves, and laying themselves out there, warts and all. If you look at Rembrandt's self-portraits over the years, and he started in his 20s, and continued to produce them through his life, uh, you can see his, his fears, uh, his, his worries shine through in ways that I don't think we do in, in quite the same way. And of course, he's not the only person who we feel a connection to because of that um, openness and willingness to look inside and, and show us what you found. And so we, all of us, have spent a lot of time over the last number of years thinking about what goes on in the mind of the patient as they complete psychological tests. And we should do that. 
we might also spend some time thinking about what's going on in the mind of the assessor as we look at psychological test results. Because you know we, imperfect processes of information, that we are. Our judgments are tainted by all kinds of misattributions, stereotypes, preconceptions, heuristics that we use to save energy and make judgments quickly. We do it, and ironically, oftentimes experience and expertise actually leads us to do it more because we get real confident in what we're doing. And so we do well to follow the lead of Rembrandt, Van Gogh, but we're limited, we know that. We're limited in what we can do. So what do we do? We're stuck, we're not really stuck, we're somewhat stuck. Five years after that article came out, Tim Wilson wrote another article, Know Thyself. Great paper, I recommend it. He provides guidelines for looking inside your head, figuring out what's going on in there. I'll tell you what they are. You may want to write this down. Three steps. Says Tim Wilson, I can't take credit for it. Whatever you do, do not introspect. <laughs> it will lead you nowhere and it will mess you up. So stop introspecting immediately. Instead, ask people who know you well to tell you what you're like. He is serious. He's tongue in cheek. He's serious. You want to know what you're like? Get four people who know you well. Ideally, get four people who know you well in different situations and contexts. Let them talk about you and come back to you with telling you what you're like. You may not like what you hear, but you'll know what you're like. Try to observe your behavior directly. Experience yourself as other people do. Most of us have had that experience, and it is why the first time you hear yourself on tape doing therapy, or the first time you see yourself on film doing an interview, if you, you have this reaction, like, please tell me that I do not really sound like that. <laughs> And, but it's an illuminating experience and it's really worth doing, you know, you know. That's all I got, thank you.